How many of you would actually build your house like this? <laughs> A few hands, but not many. I can understand that. But why on earth is it then that we have built all our cities like this? If you look at most cities around the world, and I must say Cardiff included, then this is how we have built our cities, with lots and lots of space for the car and very little space for those that matters, the human beings, us. We have actually very little space in those cities we've created ourselves. And for the main part of last century, the question we asked was, whenever we made urban development, then the question we asked was, how many cars can we get down the street? And that results in a streetscape that looks like this, where you have broad car lanes, you have space enough for parking, and then you have, well, on the side you have the sidewalks, the pavements, with very little space for people. Well, it tell, I have to tell you, it's time to change the question. And the question we should be asking in this 21st century, and that fortunately more and more cities are asking themselves, is how many people can we get down the street? And the moment we start to ask that question, the streetscape changes. And then the result is something like this, where we still have a car lane, there are people who need a car, uh, and of course they should be allowed to get around the city as well. But we can have enough, uh, a, lot, a lot of space used for public transport, in this case, on this picture, a, a tram. It could be buses, it could be many other things. It should be a broad bike lane as well. And then we have space enough for a broad promenade, a broad sidewalk, so that we can actually walk around, meet people. And you know what? In a world where already more than half of the world's population live in cities, and where it's estimated that at the midst of, midst of this century, two-thirds of all human beings in, on the earth will live in cities, meaning that our cities are growing very much then we need to use the space we have in our cities as efficiently as possible. And if you take a streetscape like this one, that is much greener, that has space enough for us humans, it's actually way more efficient than the other street you saw. This street will be able to transport something like five to seven times the amount of people that the other street you saw. So why is it? that in modern, this modern day and age, we are actually spending time on building streets that looked like before and doesn't look like this one. We ought to be build cities like this. I come from a city, city of Copenhagen in Denmark. Around two million people in greater Copenhagen, around a million in the central part, that has focused quite differently than we have seen many other cities around the world. I bike Copenhagen is the official slogan of Copenhagen. And that's actually the way that the city has built itself over the last decades. And the result, this is the commuting that we see. This is how Copenhageners get to work every morning. 62%, almost two thirds, ride their bike every morning to get to work. Around a fifth use public transport, 8% they walk, and then you have 9% who actually take their car. That's possible. Today it's at Copenhagen. Many Dutch cities have done the same thing. And it is possible in all cities around the world to make this change. But let me say, for all of you who are now thinking, ah, that's great, Morten, but Cardiff is not Copenhagen. And it's not, and it shouldn't be. You have a city that is, that is unique and that should be its own. But this is what Copenhagen used to look like. This is uh, central Copenhagen in the medieval part of town. Around 50 years ago, this is what it looked like. You have, the big, you have a big fountain there in the middle of the square that was built by a king for his coronation. And you have lots of historical buildings. And yet, this was what it, the city looked like, this, this square looked like 50, 60 years ago. One big parking space and no space for human beings. No space for commercial life, 
No space for just hanging out and be yourself. No space for life. This is what the square looks like today. Suddenly you see that the fountain is now being used as a hangout spot for young people drinking beers or wine uh, all day long or whenever they want to at least. <laughs> That's probably better. You have some commercial life there. There are a few st stalls being set up. There is a Swedish burger chain selling vegan burgers and so on. But what's interesting is if you took the picture from before and counted the number of vehicles that were parked, and then you count on this picture, the number of vehicles being parked, then you find that it's ex it is exactly the same amount. So today, exactly the same amount as 60 years ago, with the exact the same amount of people were able to take the vehicle, get into the center of town, park it, and go out and enjoy city life. The only difference is now it's bicycles. And they take up so much less space that now there is space enough for all these other activities that actually constitute, well, human life, urban life, community, like we saw before in the poll. So the moment we start changing our cities, then suddenly there is space enough for all of us. Let me give you another example. This is one of the main arteries leading into the center of Copenhagen. 1977, I was only a small kid at that time. And as you might imagine on this picture, my mom definitely wouldn't allow me on a bicycle to go anywhere. We actually lived very close to this area and uh, to the street. And this is what it looked like. You had two car lanes, which with Danish traffic culture means that you can easily fit three cars uh, next to each other. We are horrible in traffic. So uh, <clears throat> that's what it looked like at that time. Almost no space for pedestrians. And then one or two bicycles here and there dotted here. What's interesting, though, is the bus that you find up there in the middle of the picture, bus line five. Because for just around 120 years, bus line five has had the same route through Copenhagen, from horse-driven carriages to, to diesel buses and now electric buses, the same route, meaning that the city has excellent data <clears throat> on how this bus runs, how efficient it is, how many passengers there are, and of course, financing. And in 2005, a person from the city administration went into the archives and stumbled upon the schedule of 1905 and noticed, he took it back to the office and noticed that the schedule of 1905 was identical to the one 2005. Imagine 100 years of progress. Well, no progress at all. So nothing had happened. And imagine how expensive that is for a city to run its public transport like that. And how annoying it is for us commuters who just want to get to work, and especially fast home from work, every day. So the city had to do something. And they decided to close down 20 meters of this road. That's all. Ban through traffic for 20 meters of this main artery in this district of Copenhagen with 80,000 people living there. And, one, and saying, now it's only public transport, bicycles and pedestrians that are allowed on these 20 meters. On the rest of the street, nothing happened, except that it was rebuilt. And this is what it look, looks like today. The picture is kind of reversed from the one you saw before. It was easier to put up a drone at the other end, but still, it's the same street. Now you see one car lane that also doubles as a bus lane. You see five and a half meter wide bike tracks in each direction. Five and a half meters in each direction. And you see very broad promenades. And suddenly, uh, you see a street that is being focused for people, not for the cars. The whole transformation here cost something like four million pounds, just to give you an estimate of that. And uh, the results were pretty staggering. Because 5% pe more people now are in the public transport. A little disappointing, I know, for the city. But these 5% more, together with the buses running more efficiently, actually means that this 4 million investment has now already been paid back. Because a faster, more efficient public transport is also a cheaper public transport, meaning that the city has now more money to do something else. That's pretty good, good for all us taxpayers, that our money can be used, uh, spent as efficiently as possible. The city has put them back in public transport. That's pretty good. 
But it also means when you look at the numbers that there are, there are almost 60% less cars on the street, or the whole of the street, and 60% more bicycles. But interestingly enough, there's 165% more pedestrians. And a lot of those are actually kids, young people, especially kids and old people actually, who suddenly feel safe when they're there. Their parents don't mind them walking to school on their own. They don't have to be let there. They can walk alone. And that means that we get more independent kids. That's pretty good. And it means that a lot of our old people actually feel safe again, being part of their community. That is great for them, but it's also great for the local community that suddenly it's much more diverse than it used to be. And then as you see in the at, at the right side, 1400% more people are now just sitting there, relaxing, enjoying their time. Sitting on the bridge, for instance, or somewhere else, just with a bottle of wine, a cup of coffee, enjoying time with their friends. This project that started out as a, as a traffic project has suddenly become a project of urban life. There is nothing special to this. Any city can do this. Copenhagen is one of the first to actually take it to a new level on how to really implement new traffic systems that also work as urban life systems, but any city can do this. It works. So today, rush hour looks like this, where you still have a few cars, you have a bus that now, as I said, go much faster through the whole street. And on, on a, an average day, 48,000 people are commuting here on bicycles. That's actually the busiest bike, bike lane in the world, um, that here in the central part of Copenhagen. And the reason for that is pretty simple. It's not because Copenhagen has spent millions and millions and millions on campaigns. They don't work. And the city hasn't spent millions and millions on paint on the street, because that doesn't work either. Paint on the street is the lazy politician or the lazy planner's way of saying, I don't care. Just so you know. <laughs> what actually works is when you get new infrastructure, you put in, in this case, curb separated uh, bicycle tracks where the traffic is being separated so that it's safe and easy for the bicycle riders to, uh, to ride to work. In this uh, part of the central Copenhagen where you actually have the taxis and then they, there's a little space so then the passengers can get in and out. But it can also be like this, where you have the curb separation, so you have three layers of the road. Meaning that we have the cars here, and they're being separated from the bicycle lane by a curb, so the cars don't accidentally swerve onto the bike lane and use it as a parking lot or as an extra car lane. We don't want that. That's unsafe. That's also why I say paint doesn't work. Because we know car drivers incidentally, accidentally swerve onto the bike lane whenever they have the chance. We need to avoid that. But actually we would also like to avoid that the bicyclists, they swerve onto the uh, sidewalk as well. Because that creates unsafe situations for the pedestrians. And we need kids, old people and the rest of us to feel safe as well when we are walking in the city. So this layer, this layered street and the curb separation really works. So that suddenly, well, you have, in this case, a parent uh, bringing the, the kids to, uh, to kindergarten or to school uh, in a cargo bike. One in four families in Copenhagen don't own a car. They have bought a cargo bike instead and bring their kids to kindergarten instead. Uh, you now see cargo bikes in Copenhagen fitted out with seat belts, with cushions. There's even a small entrepreneur in, uh, in a district that came up to me one day and said, I want to be the first to install airbags in a cargo bike. <laughs> I don't know if he actually succeeded yet, but I think that shows a little bit also how you can actually create a whole new economy around this. A lot of small and medium-sized enterprises that thrive on this new way of, of creating a city. And when we are talking about cargo bikes, well, they're actually good for anything in the world. From, in this case, I was about to say cradle, but before the cradle, and, of course, until grave. Um, this is uh, the funeral ladies, which the company is called, which actually formed a few years ago and has now a thriving business on taking the, the, uh, the deceased from the chapel to the cemetery on this uh, bike hearse. 
And I can only say one thing to my family. Uh, I don't care how they celebrate or mourn when, when I die, but I definitely want to go on one of these. Uh, <laughs> because born and raised in Copenhagen, that is the way that, we, that I want to go, that I want to be part of it. And the bicycle, in this case the cargo bike, is a way to transform our cities in a matter where we can certainly create urban life, where we can celebrate that we are there together. Where in this case a father doesn't mind bringing his uh, kid and a bit of luggage, I don't know where they're going, probably to the central station to go somewhere on, on a small vacation, or it could just be to school. We note that nobody here on my pictures wear a helmet. We don't need helmets when the city is safe. And that's what we always should demand of our cities, of our planners, of our politicians. Create a safe city for me. It should, shouldn't just be my responsibility that everything is okay. It should actually be the city that is built for us, built for human life. And the moment we have a city that is built like this, where she feels pretty safe, although probably a little annoyed that her father gave her a suitcase to sit with her, then we actually have a very different city, a city built for life. And that's what the whole point, that's what all this is about, that this bicycle can actually transform our cities and make them the future city, and they should be. Thank you.